Let me just say good morning as you're having a seat or finding your seats anyway. Uh, my name's Sean. I'm one of the pastors here at Harbor Church. It's a pleasure to be worshiping with you. Uh, and I have the privilege of opening up God's word this morning. So grab your Bibles and turn to Psalm chapter 22. And if you need a Bible, our ushers are coming down the aisles. They would love to hand you one. Just raise your hand. They'll give one to you. That would be our gift. We would love to have you have a copy of God's word in front of you this morning. Psalm chapter 22, as we continue, continue our Psalms of the Savior sermon series this morning. As you're opening your Bibles, maybe you've heard the song. It's very common around Christmas time. We hear it in department stores, if you go to those anymore, uh, on the radio. Andy Williams sings this famous song. It's the most wonderful time of the year. I'll spare you my singing of it, but you can listen to him. And the words, he says, it's the most wonderful time of the year with kids jingle bell and everyone telling you, be of good cheer. It's the most wonderful time of the year. Verse two, it's the hap happiest season of all with those holiday greetings and gay happy meetings when friends come to call. It's the hap happiest season of all. And indeed, this can be and is a joyous time of the year. It is a most wonderful time of the year, but not necessarily for everybody. There's another classic Christmas song sung by Dean Martin. It's the Christmas blues. Maybe you've heard that one. In it, he sings of this longing of, of being alone, and, and he says, Christmas is a joy of joy, but friends, when you're lonely, you'll find that it's only a thing for little girls and little boys. Sometimes there's sadness in the Christmas season. When you're lonely, when you feel abandoned, when you feel forsaken, there's no joy in the Christmas season. Another Christmas blues song. I have no idea who this is. Sabrina Claudio, I have no idea who that is, but she sings, it's been a long year, the toughest of my life so far. I've tried to feel cheer, but I'm farther than the northern star. For her, at least the person singing this song, the joy of Christmas is as far away as the stars are for us. The reality is that this Christmas season, with as much hope and joy as there ought to be there, or as there could be there, is not the universal experience for everybody. This season brings sadness sometimes, pain, especially for those who feel alone or abandoned or forsaken. And yet, the message of Christmas, indeed the message of the Bible, speaks not just to the joy of the angels, but also to the Christmas blues, to the pains and the sorrows of the season that we experience at times. And certainly, the Psalms of the Savior speak to those very things. These Messianic Psalms that point to our Savior, Jesus. In fact, I think there is no better place to turn all of Scripture than to the Psalms to, to feel, to experience the highest of highs of, of human emotion and also the lowest of lows and everything in between there. What's been your experience this Christmas season? Is it the most wonderful time of the year? Is it joy-filled for you today? Or are you maybe more in the Christmas blues? If we're honest, if we look around at one another, there are people here this morning who have walked through some suffering. There's pain of loss, loss of a loved one, a spouse, loss of a child. There's relational struggle and strife, marriages that are having difficulties, separation, divorce maybe. There's estrangement from children. There's all kinds of pain, even in our midst this morning, that only gets heightened at Christmas time. And if that's you this morning, then I think God has something to speak to you this morning from Psalm 22. When we feel these sorrows and sufferings and agonies and pains, when the struggles, struggles come, when there's abandonment or feeling forsaken, what will we do in those moments? Where will we turn? I think Psalm 22 has some answers for us. And even if you're not in the Christmas blues, this sermon is still for you for two reasons. First of all, you'll encounter someone who is in that situation, who has uh, come, come up, you might experience someone or rub shoulders with someone who has experienced some loss or pain this Christmas season. And so how can you speak the comfort of Christ to them? How can you help them in the midst of their sufferings? I don't want to give trite cliches and silly little phrases that we say to one another to try to give hope that are really fruitless and meaningless. I want to give someone the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's reason number one. And reason number two, even if you're not experiencing that abandonment, that forsakenness, that pain of life, live long enough and you will experience it. It's a given in this fallen world. 
And sadly, it is probably far more common to experience suffering than it is to experience joy and happiness in this life. And so you too need to know how to deal with the sufferings when they come. And so again, I would say this sermon is for you as well. There's something here in Psalm 22 for all of us this morning. Now at the outset, I wanna man- help you manage your expectations. We are not going to solve, we're not gonna dive into this question of why. Why is there suffering? Why is there pain? Ultimately, we know it's because of the fall of mankind, that there is sin in this world, that all manner of catastrophes happen. And we know that God is sovereignly in control. But beyond that, there's a ton of mystery in that question of why. And we simply have to trust that God knows what he's doing because no one has a great answer for that problem. And yet what I hope you will see here is how David, the man after God's own heart, deals with it. And what we see here is a pattern of lament that is pervasive throughout the Psalms and other scriptures. It's a form of prayer in the midst of tragedy. And so this morning, we come to Psalm 22. And I'm sure as we read, you will instantly recognize where this is quoted in the New Testament. It is unavoidable for the Christian to read this and not think of Jesus. And we will get there this morning. But before we do, I want you to enter into David's experience here, to feel the emotion, the the crying out to God that he has to enter into this lament with him this morning. And so where are we going? I want you to see how David, the man after God's own heart, and even Jesus, the God-man, deal with this sorrow and this pain of life. Now I want you to know that when you do encounter suffering and agony in this world, there's a way to deal with it. What will you do when that comes? If you're not prepared for it, you're in danger of having your faith crumble. When you feel forsaken by God, it's easy to walk away and say, God, you've abandoned me, I'm gonna abandon you. And in fact, I think that's why a lot of people self-destruct their faith, deconstruct their faith. They can't deal, they don't know how to deal with this pain that might come in life. And so I wanna help you prepare for those moments. You know, I know of a man who was going through a divorce who sat with me and talked with me with tears in in his eyes and, and said, I prayed so earnestly for this not to happen. How could God let this happen? He couldn't understand why there was suffering and sorrow and pain in his life. And so with tears in his eyes, he cried out to God and felt abandoned and forsaken. And later, left the faith. And now has all manner of crazy ideas about spirituality and God. He was not prepared to handle the struggles of life. I don't want that for you. I want you to be prepared to know how to handle when grief and pain of life come. And I think Psalm 22 helps us to do that. And so we see this morning, the raw emotions of David, his pouring out his heart to God. We see David's lament and his earnest prayers to God in anguish and pain, pleading his cause. And what's the result? David realizes that God has rescued me, he says. God comes through. God rescues. God reveals himself. God revives David and God delivers David. And as a result, David's pain turns to praise. Watch for that this morning. And all of this points to Jesus on the cross where we see the deliverance of Jesus for us, where Jesus' suffering, his forsakenness, his crying out amidst the pain of the crucifixion turns to our deliverance and helps us to praise God. I want you to see that this morning, that God rescues, God delivers, and he does it through Jesus. And because of the rescue of Jesus, our pain, our suffering in this life can turn into the praise of God as we pray and trust in God's purpose and plan for us. And so let's read Psalm 22 and hear the lament of David calling out to God. Psalm 22. To the choir master, according to the doe of the dawn, a psalm of David. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel, and you are fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. 
Yet you are he who took me from my mother's womb. You made me trust at my mother's breasts. On you I was cast from my birth. And from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near and there is none to help me. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I'm poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me and a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O oh Lord, do not be far off. O oh, you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. And I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. And stand in awe of him, all of you, offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he's not hidden his face from him, but he has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied, and those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you, for kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth shall eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him, and shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. And they shall come and proclaim his righteousness to the people yet unborn, that he has done it. Father God, we thank you for your word to us this morning. And Lord, I ask for your help. God, we need you. If these next minutes will be of any help to us, God, we need you to speak to us by your spirit. God, would you overcome whatever barriers or obstacles might be in our way that would keep us from hearing you, Lord. God, grant that we have ears to hear and eyes to see you this morning. And God, I pray for all of those who might be walking through suffering now, through pain and sorrow or sickness, or whatever it may be. Use my words, God. Use your words for the good of your people and for your glory. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's begin with Psalm 22, verse 1, and see David as he expresses his pain before God. He says in verse 1 and 2, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry to you by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. What do we see here? We see this feeling of abandonment. David cries out, God, you seem so far away. Don't you hear me? Don't you know I'm crying out to you? This is David's experience. He's, these are his emotions. There's pain for David of feeling abandoned by God. Have you ever felt this way? God, where are you? God, don't you hear me when I'm praying? Don't you hear me when I call to you? God, I don't see you in the midst of this. I don't hear your voice speaking now, God. I don't know what your plan is. And, and God, this doesn't make sense to me. I don't know why you've allowed all of this suffering to happen. It doesn't seem right or fair or good. God, where are you? Do you know what I'm going through right now? God, you have abandoned me. Where are you, Lord? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I hear a call of desperation in David. I hear a deep sense of need. Have you cried out to God in that desperation before? Where are you, God? You feel so far away. I cry, but you do not answer. But notice a few things here. Notice David's language. Even though he speaks of God being far off, the language is actually very of closeness. He says, my God, my God. It's not God, some power out there in the universe, some deistic thinking about who God is. no. My God, my God, there's a closeness here, even though David doesn't feel like he's close to God. And I think deep down he knows that God truly has not forsaken him. God has not overlooked him nor abandoned him. And 
we can know, friends, that God has not forsaken or abandoned us, even in the midst of our struggles. And I'm struck here as well that this is no short-lived experience of David. You know, sometimes you can get a little paper cut or whatever it is, and, oh, this hurts, and it's there now, but it's gone a few seconds later. This is not David's experience of the pain he's speaking of. He's crying out by day and by night over and over again. David is pouring himself out. This speaks to me of a lengthy season of agony. And in all of this, hear David's earnest questions, his honest pouring out to God. God, where are you? But notice, we'll see this over and over again in this psalm. David speaks of his own experience, and then he turns his gaze to God. He goes from pain to prayer over and over and over again. Verses three through five, David's pain, his forsakenness of God turns into prayer. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel, and you are fathers trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. David's pain turns to prayer. And what's interesting about this prayer is that David is calling to mind the things of old, the things that God has done. He's thinking about God's works in the past. He's remembering what God has done. Maybe God doesn't seem near to David, but David knows he can trust that God has not abandoned his forefathers. Maybe David feels forsaken, but he knows that his ancestors turned to God and God delivered him. He cried out, they cried out, and God was there to rescue them. And David takes comfort and solace knowing what God has done in the past. And for you, it may feel like God is not here in the present. Let me encourage you to bring to mind what God has done in the past. That's why reading the Bible is so important. It's the record of God's works in history, in all of redemptive history. It should give us encouragement that the God who saved Israel can save you, that the God who delivered Elijah can deliver you. It's also why reading biographies of great men and women of the faith can be so important and helpful for us. When it feels like God is far off, it's helpful to turn and to remember that God has been faithful to others. And so David's pain turns to prayer as he remembers the goodness of God toward others, toward his fathers. And his pain's not over, and he brings it to mind again. Back to David's experience, verses six through eight, but I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord deliver him. Let the Lord rescue him, for he delights in him. Now David's back to his lamenting. Whereas before he lamented God's abandonment, now his experiences have been insulted, being forsaken by all the people around. He's walking around and all the people who see him, they mock him and make mouths at him and judge him and wag their heads in shame. They insult David for his trust in the Lord. Do you see that? He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord deliver him. It's mockery. Let the Lord rescue him. Let the Lord deliver him because he delights in him. They add insult to David's pain. They insult David for his trust in God. How wretched are these people? Rather than encourage David and speak hope to him, help him trust in God, they mock him for his trust. You ever felt that way? Mocked by the people around you? feeling abandoned by not just God, but everyone around you. There's no one you can turn to for help, no friend to call on, no family to lean into, no community to support you or care for you. Maybe you felt that way, like everyone around you has abandoned you. It makes me think of the story of Job. I'm sure you know that story. Job loses everything. He loses his family, his property, his, his goods, his children die. He gets sores all over his body. And his wife, in Job's moment of anguish and pain, she says, let go of your integrity. Curse God and die. Just let it go, Job. Curse God and die. Almost to say, don't continue trusting in God, but rather curse God and let him put you out of your misery. Have you felt that way, friends? Here I think we see David feeling like a worm, like a slimy, wriggly, worthless little creature that comes out of the ground when it rains. And he's received the taunting of the world around him. How will you handle the taunting when it comes against you? 
when you're taunted for your trust in God. Friends, that's coming. Our culture is getting increasingly hostile towards faith, towards Christianity, and it's just a matter of time before people will taunt you for your trust in God. How will you respond to them? If you are taunted, know that you're in good company. They said the very same things of Jesus as he was on the cross. Pain and prayer. Back to David's experience of pain, and yet David's gaze is fixed again on God, verses 9 through 11. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust in my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. And here again, David calls to mind this this memory of God, the power of memory here. I remember what you have done for me. You took me from the womb, he says. You made me trust at my mother's breast. When I was utterly helpless, you helped me. When I could do nothing, when all I had was your provision, God, you provided for me. You proved yourself faithful in the days of my infancy when there was no one else to trust but you. You came through. What can help us in the time of pain? Remembering that God has been faithful to us. You know, J.R. touched on this a couple weeks ago. He, in this imagery of, of being an, an infant, a child, it's powerful. Children are completely and totally helpless. A baby can do nothing for itself. All they can do is cry and eat and poop. They need their family to do everything else. They need mom to feed them and bathe them and clothe them and protect them and hold them and nurture them and care for them. Babies are absolutely desperate for their parents' help all the days of their life. And David says, God, that is like my relationship with you. I am totally dependent upon you. Twice now, David has looked back on God's goodness over time. Memory is a powerful tool for us, my friends, in the midst of pain and sorrow to remember what God has done, to remember that he has provided and he has cared for us We remember how God has caused us to trust in him. And this memory helps us to cry out to God and ask for his help. That's what David does. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. And yet again, David switches back now to talk of his pain. It's a little longer, verses 12 through 18, but he says, Many bulls encompass me. The strong bulls of Bashan, they surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. And I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They've pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones, and they stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. What's David saying here? All around him, he's surrounded. The bulls encompass me. The strong bulls of Bashan, they surround me like lions, like ravening, like devouring lions. He says, the dogs encompass me. The evildoers, they encircle me. David is surrounded by evil on every single side. It's as if the monsters have come for him. You know, we don't think of bulls as things that are scary because we eat them all the time. We don't think of lions as being frightening creatures because we stay away from them. We put them in zoos behind big cages and glass, yet stand out on an empty open plain in front of a lion with nowhere to run, no shelter, no refuge, and you will experience what David feels here. That's the image that we see. These monsters, these ferocious creatures surrounding David on every side. And David says, my strength fails. Just look at what he says. My heart fails is like wax. It is melted within my breast. David's strength just melts away from him. Or he's like water that's being poured out. His heart melts. His strength is gone. All his courage, his fortitude, his ability to stand, it's all gone away. Washed away like water, melted away like wax. Or he changes the image just a little bit, talking about his strength being dried up like a potsherd. His tongue sticks to his jaws. He's laid in the dust of death. It's like a scorching sun has beat down on him so long that he's just withered away. And he just crumbles like a piece of pottery, like a broken piece of pottery would just crumble 
in the hot sun. And he's so parched, so thirsty. There's no spit even in his mouth that his, his tongue sticks to the roof of his mouth. So weak is David, so needy is he in this moment. He's in circle on every side, his strength melting, evaporating, turned to dust. Maybe you feel that way. God, I've cried out and I've got nothing left. This sickness has taken everything from me. This sorrow, this heartache has taken everything. God, I'm running on fumes. My tank is empty. It is bone dry. This is David's experience of his suffering. Have you felt that way? You know, apart from David's suffering, here he points to something else incredible. He mentions that they've pierced his hands and his feet and they've divided up his garments among them. For his clothing, they've cast lots. There's nowhere that we know of in all of scripture where David has experienced this actually in his own person. Acts 2 tells us that David was a prophet. He often prophesied about the one who was to come. And so here we see nothing less than the prophecy about Jesus to come. We see in this psalm, especially here in these verses, Christ on the cross. We looked at this a few weeks ago, didn't we, in our Mark sermon series. Jesus on the cross, his strength failed him. I have no doubt that Jesus' bones were pulled apart by the torture of the Romans that his heart was melted like wax. And we know he was in great thirst and his hands and his feet were pierced and surrounded on every side were the monsters waiting to devour him. And they divided Jesus' clothes among them, casting lots. This psalm is a picture of the anguish and suffering of Jesus on the cross. And where did Jesus turn to in his moment of need? when he was surrounded, when all hope seemed to be lost for him, he, like David, cried out to God in prayer. Where will you turn when all your strength has failed, when you have nothing left? Will you, like Jesus, cry out to God? And where does David turn in his moment of need? He turns to God and cries out again in prayer. Verse 19 and 21, here is the crux of this psalm. This point of climax, as David cries out, it is the hinge on which everything turns. After this point, everything in this psalm changes. Hear what David says. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. David is pleading, oh Lord, do not be far off from me. God, I feel forsaken by you, but do not be far off. Oh, you my help, come to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from those lions. He cries out for God's deliverance. Do not be far, but help me, Lord. How do you deal with pain and trial and suffering? Friends, we can see much that we ought to do in this psalm. Cry out to God as David does. This whole psalm has been a lengthy pouring out to God of raw, pure, unrestrained emotion. And that's good. That is right for us to do. Don't hold back in your prayer to God, but pour yourself out to him in the midst of your struggles, in your sufferings. Lament to God. He can handle it. Ask your tough questions. Bring your burdens to God. Cry out, God, I don't understand. Why, God? Why am I sick right now? Why do I have this disease? Why do I have cancer, God? I don't get it. I don't understand, Lord. Why did my spouse cheat on me and leave me? Why did this happen? Why did my baby die? Why did my grandmother, my grandfather, why did my child, why did my sibling, why did my spouse, why are they taken from me? Why does it hurt so bad right now, God? Why does it feel so wrong? I don't understand. Help me. Deliver me, God. Be not far off from me, but come and help. We ought to do what David has done here, crying out to God. This expression of this raw emotion and pain is the key to lamenting. This whole psalm is a lament, one long cry of God for deliverance. We don't lament well in our day. I rarely hear about lamenting today, but it is an important practice that we should have in our lives. And this psalm gives us permission to lament. 
In fact, 59 of the Psalms are laments. That's 40% of the Psalms. Over and over again, David and the other psalmists, they pour out their hearts in lament to God for all of the pains. They cry out to God in the midst of their sufferings. And so we ought to cry out to God in sorrow, in complaint, in confusion. It's a l- lamenting is a uniquely Christian practice. And it's a practice that will help us deal with the sorrow and the anguish when it comes. And there's some things in this psalm that we can see about lamenting. Lamenting begins with bringing our complaint to God. It's a letting go of, of what we want in this life and, and experiencing uh, God's nearness. It's a bringing our complaint before God. It's the cry of saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And a turning to God, as David has done time and again, and an asking for help, and a choosing to trust, which David models for us. He trusts in God to deliver him. And friends, we need to learn to lament in our day if we're gonna deal with the sufferings of this life. One author I read said, the practice of lament is one of the most theologically informed actions a person can take. While crying is fundamental to humanity, Christians lament because they know God is sovereign and that God is good. Christians know his promise in the scriptures, and we believe in God's power to deliver. We believe in God's power to deliver us in our sufferings because we see it in the cross of Jesus Christ, the very place that this lament psalm points us to. You see, this psalm is a psalm of the Savior because it so clearly points to Jesus. We can't help but read these words and think of Jesus on the cross because both Matthew and Mark, they quote this psalm at Jesus' crucifixion. And what's fascinating, we didn't look at this when we talked about it at Mark, but but Matthew and Mark, they both unfold the psalm backwards from the bottom up. If you read Matthew 27, for example, Matthew begins with saying that they crucified Jesus. They pierced his hands and his feet. That's Psalm twenty-two, sixteen, 16. And they cast lot for his clothes, Psalm twenty-two, eighteen. 18. And Matthew goes on to explain that they derided Jesus. They were wagging their heads at him. Psalm 22, verses seven through eight. All who seek me mock me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. And it culminates, it climaxes in, in the cry of Jesus from the cross, Psalm 22, one. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Both Matthew and Mark build Psalm 22 to this climactic saying of Jesus on the cross, his suffering, his anguish, his lament. And on the cross, we see the humanity of Jesus in plain view. We see Jesus suffered as we do. Jesus' strength failed. His heart melted. His body was out of joint. He felt abandoned, forsaken by God. He hurt as we hurt, suffered as we suffer. His pains, our pains. And in Jesus' lament, he calls out to God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, Jesus was made like us in every way, except he was without sin. And because of that, Jesus could be the perfect sacrifice for us. And most importantly, Because Jesus was the perfect sacrifice, he was the one that could come to our rescue in our suffering, in our sin. And this is why Jesus came, my friends. This is what we remember at Christmas time, that Jesus came to deliver us. He came incarnated. He took on flesh and dwelt among us to deliver us from our enemies, to rescue us from our sin and from our shame. He came to release us from our bondage and to bring us to his kingdom. And on the cross, we see that through Jesus, God has rescued us. And we see David in Psalm 22, even declaring this rescue of God at the end of verse 21. David says, you have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. Do you see that? You have rescued me, or better still, from the horns of wild oxen, you have rescued me. This is the crux and climax of this psalm, the point of no return. God has rescued David in the midst of his suffering. And we can trust that if God rescued David in his moment of need, God will rescue us too. Indeed, God has rescued us. From the cross, Jesus lives Psalm 22, which is a telling of the rescue of God. 
On the surface, it may seem like Jesus was forsaken, that Jesus was abandoned, that God did not rescue Jesus. And yet we know that after Jesus came down from the cross, three days later, he rose again, that God did not abandon Jesus, did not leave him dead, but raised him in newness of life, caused him to walk out of the grave. And scripture is very clear on this point. Jesus was the first fruits of the resurrection to come for us, for those who would believe in him. That if we're united with Christ in a death like his, we also will be united with him in a resurrection like his. You see, the cross and the resurrection are God's plan of rescue for us. And in this, there is great hope that in every circumstance, no matter what it is, including our suffering, there's hope in the gospel of God. In the midst of our sorrows and agonies, we must remember to hope in Jesus, that Jesus will come to our aid, that Jesus will come to our rescue, that Jesus will come and will give us hope in the midst of our sufferings, that because of Jesus' sacrifice, God will never leave us or forsake us. He will not abandon us. And in remembering what Christ has suffered for you, there is great hope for our souls in the midst of our sufferings. You know, some of you are very familiar with the story of the writing of the, soul, of the, the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. I'm sure many of you know that, right? If you don't know, Horatio Spafford, he knew something of life's unexpected challenges. Uh, he was a successful attorney, a real estate investor who lost his fortune in the great Chicago fire, 1871. It was around that time that his beloved four-year-old son died of scarlet fever. And so thinking a vacation would help him and his family would do some good, he sent his wife and four daughters on ahead, on a ship to England. He planned to join them after he finished some pressing business on the home front. Yet, as that ship sailed across the Atlantic, it was involved in a terrible collision, and it sunk. And more than 200 people lost their lives, including his four beloved daughters. On arriving in England, his wife, surviving the, surviving the crash, sent a telegram, saved alone, what shall I do? And so Horatio immediately set sail for England, and at one point during the voyage, the captain of the ship, aware that Tragedy had struck Horatio's family. As they were passing over that area, told Horatio, this is where the other ship sank. And as Horatio thought about his daughters, words of comfort and hope filled his heart and mind. And he wrote down these beautiful words of this well-beloved hymn that we know. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. And he goes on in the next stanza to say, though Satan should buffet, though trial should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. You see, in the agony and despair of loss, I can't help but imagine Horatio feeling forsaken by God. And yet what was his hope? It was the knowledge that Christ had regarded his helpless estate, that Christ had come and had shed his own blood for his soul. And so there is great hope in this blessed assurance of what Christ has done in the midst of suffering. We can have great hope in the rescue of Christ, like Horatio and like great saints from the past. Because of that, because of our crying out in pain to God, because of the rescue of Jesus in our pain, as we pray, it can turn into the praise of God as we trust in him. And this is where Psalm 22 ends. The rescue of God turns from pain to praise. This is how Psalm 22 ends. Look really quickly with me. Verses 22 through 26. David changes from this agony into the praise of God. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he's not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. He has not hidden his face from him, but he has heard when he cried to him. For, you come to, for from you comes my praises in the great congregation. My vows I will perform for those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. Do you see how the 
pain of David turns into the praise of God in the congregation. David's wailing turns to worship, his lamentation to songs of praise. He realizes that God indeed has rescued him, and so he praises God even in the midst of his sufferings. He makes praise in the congregation. David remembers the deliverance of God, the rescue plan of God, and so his pain turns to praise. And I love that David's praise cannot be contained. It moves outward from the midst of the congregation outward to the whole world, which we see in the following verses. 22 through 27, all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules the nations. You see, it's, it's expanding outward, not just from the congregation of Israel, but now to all the world, because God is king over all. And David remembers the sovereign control of God over all the nations, and so he praises God. And expands even further still, from the congregation to the world, then to every generation to come. All the prosperous of the earth shall worship, or shall eat before, all the prosperous of the earth shall eat and worship. Before him shall bow down all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to the people yet unborn that he has done it. You see David's praise going out to every generation. God has rescued David, and so David must tell all the world and every generation to come of the rescue of God, that all might come and serve him and know what he has done for them. David wants the whole world and every generation to know what the Lord has done, that he has rescued David. And so what do we see in this psalm? There's this wonderful turn in this lament. It begins with a crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yet in his pain, David turns to prayer. He knows that he's not forsaken by God. Though he asks these questions, he knows that he's not abandoned. And rather than abandon David, God comes to deliver David, to rescue David. And so David's pain turns to praise as he pours out his heart in prayer to God and trusts in him. And all of this, all of this points us to Jesus who from the cross cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Have you ever wondered why Jesus speaks that psalm? There's some conversation, some questions, some debate about why Jesus spoke Psalm 22 from the cross. But I'm persuaded that in speaking those words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus wants us to have in mind all of Psalm 22. He wants us to have in mind the deliverance of God that results in our praise of him that ultimately God comes to rescue, that through Jesus on the cross, God will deliver us, God will rescue us, God has not abandoned us. And so in the midst of our sufferings, in the midst of our pain, we like David can call out to God and we can feel his deliverance and our pain can turn to praise. And so friends, as I close, I just want you to remember that your pain and suffering in this life, if you pray, if you turn to God, it can result in praise to him. And it's because of the rescue of Jesus. So turn in faith to him. Trust in God's deliverance for you. In your suffering, in your pain, turn to God in prayer and see how he will work all this out to result in praise to him and your good. Let me close with 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 18. Listen to what Paul has to say about his own sufferings about his afflictions and what God has done in the midst of it. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. And skipping on to verse 16, Paul continues, in the midst of his sufferings and afflictions, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, 
momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Afflicted in every way, persecuted, but not driven to despair, struck down, but not destroyed. And in light of all of that, Paul tells us not to lose heart for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And so friend, this morning, if you're in the midst of the Christmas blues, if you're feeling forsaken or abandoned by God, if you're suffering, if there's pain or sorrow, do not lose heart in the midst of that. But remember what God has done for you. Remember that in your suffering, Jesus has suffered like you and Jesus has suffered for you. And so let that be a comfort to you. Remember that Jesus has delivered you. Jesus has rescued you. And because Jesus has rescued you, your pain can turn to praise as you pray and trust in God. Let's pray. Oh, good and gracious Father, Lord, we thank you for the rescue of Jesus. We think that you sent your son to save sinners like us. You saved a sinner like me. You save us from the eternal consequences of our sin. You deliver us from Satan's kingdom into the kingdom of light, into the kingdom of your beloved son if we have faith in you. God, you do not promise to remove all suffering in this life, yet you will not abandon us in the midst of it. And we know that you are sovereignly in control of all things at all times, even over our pains and our sorrows. And so, God, we want to trust in you. Help us to trust in you, God. We ask for a greater faith, a greater trust in you in this present world as we await the pleasures and joys that are to come in Christ. And Father, this morning I pray for those who might be suffering, those who might be sick, those who might be walking through struggles and trials and are not sure what to do with that, Lord. I pray that they would cry out to you. They would lament the pains of this world, God, but they would know that you have rescued them, that you will never leave them nor forsake them. And so, God, I pray that in some miraculous way that you would cause their pain to turn to praise as they remember to pray and to trust in you. And God, we thank you that you rescue us, that you do not leave us, but that you are near. And so, God, help us not to lose heart when suffering comes and to see them as light and momentary afflictions that are producing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all compare as we seek after you. Help us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.